Okay, so we're recording. This is a pregnancy and training webinar. Now, I ha I'm holding this webinar because there is a lot of, um, I guess, myths around training, and I'm seeing a lot of women who are heavily pregnant lifting heavy weights and training, and I'm also getting a lot of my clients saying, well, should I be doing that sort of training during my pregnancy? So... It just happens to be that um, I bumped into an old friend, an old school friend of mine, Rebecca Pugh. Le less of the old, Rachel. <laughs> well, no, we're both <laughs> old now. Come on, <laughs> no, we're still in our thirties. So, um, uh, old school friends from back in the day, and um, yeah. Rebecca happens to be living around a corner from me now, and um, she's, uh, you know, continued um, in medicine, and obviously I've, I've come out of physio now, but. I just thought, you know, if you guys are listening to this on YouTube in the future, I'll just give you a little bit of a background um, to Rebecca and also to myself um, so that you know that the information that's coming is from a medical perspective and also um, a practical training approach. Because I know a lot of the information that's out there is quite conflicting and sometimes you need, uh, you know, as we'll talk about today, not everything is black and white and there are plenty of shades of grey, but we are hoping to provide you with some form of guidelines as to what you can apply so you can apply safe training in your pregnancy. So first of all, Dr. Rebecca Pugh, um, she graduated from Nottingham University Medical School in 2004 and is now a senior doctor in obstetrics and gynecology. Um, Rebecca has a special interest in trying to improve women's health and fitness in order to boost fertility, sustain healthy pregnancy and enhance postnatal recovery. Rebecca has a vast experience in helping women through uh, the anxiety of labor and delivery through previous birth trauma. In her daily practice, she also helps many women struggling with just, um, gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, and obesity during pregnancy. Rebecca firmly believes that uh, through a healthy mind and body uh, can achieve, can, sorry, can help women of all women thinking of embarking or going through this very special time in their lives. With an athletic background, Rebecca played lacrosse for Wales and county hockey and netball and enjoyed Thai boxing for many years. She's now a keen skier in golf and has two children under two. So, girls, <laughs> um, Beck was is like my ideal candidate for a doctor to get on a podcast because not only is she a specialist in obs and gynae, and am I correct in saying that you're just about to get your consultant's role? Yes, that's right. That's very yeah, I've just, just just taking a little bit of maternity leave. <laughs> awesome. At the moment. Just so, delay things. Yeah, so professionally you're well equipped. You're well equipped as a mum of two under two and you have an athletic background as well. So and I know yeah. you used to be a superstar athlete at school. So <laughs> <laughs> I remember those days. <laughs> So I guess a little bit about me. Um, I graduated from the University of Birmingham in uh, 2005 um, with a graduate of physiotherapy and I continued my postgraduate studies at Sydney University. And so with my background in physiotherapy um, and now in health and fitness and particularly in training the female body, um, I'm very passionate about bringing balance back into women's lives and, and, and transforming women into confident and healthy women and therefore confident and healthy mums. Um, I am the CEO of um, Athleta Fox, um, and Athleta Fox is the trusted go-to resource for women who are fed up of the industry bullshit, um, of incorrect information, and being on a roller coaster of dieting, guilt, restriction, binging, and self-deprivation. And let's be honest here, a lot of women carry those traits into pregnancy. So with my, pre my previous 12 years of fitness industry experience, um, I've actually trained many uh, ladies through pregnancy from conception right through to post-birth. Um, so with both of us on the call, like ladies, if you do have any questions, please do ask them in the question box. Yeah. But essentially this is gonna be a very um, informal chat. Um, I have got some questions here, but I guess like, you know, Beck, we had a, a, a chat offline about this um, mm -hmm. and the kind of structure that we wanted. Let's just start yeah. off like, changes that happen in your body like maybe we go for the first mm -hmm. and the third trimester like what actually happens yeah. in the body when you fall pregnant yeah well I, I think that probably the important thing to say first of all before you even get pregnant is it's to make sure that you're in the best sort of physical shape before you even think about getting 
pregnant. So, you know, you want to be fit and healthy and to make sure that, you know, your weight is under control because we know that women who do this have much happier and healthier pregnancies. Uh, it's also important that you start taking your folic acid and uh, fish oils before you start thinking about getting pregnant. Once you do get pregnant in the first trimester, your levels of progesterone and estrogen will go up markedly. And these sort of things cause you to have you know, sort of breast enlargement, you retain water, um, you can sometimes feel a bit bloated and obviously very tired. And then some people suffer a lot with nausea and vomiting and in its most severe form, hyperemesis, which can be really debilitating for a lot of women. Um, you're also, because of the higher levels of progesterone, um, your gut slows down, so you're much more likely to be constipated. So all those things together mean that you know you are going to put on on weight. That's normal, um, but it's important that you keep really well hydrated and that you eat healthily. And if you've already embarked on a you know already doing a training regime, that you continue to do that. But you have to listen to your own body as well because there's going to be days where you just feel rubbish and you don't want to do anything. Um, what do you think, Rach? I think, like, you know, if we just talk about the first trimester first, the the thing that I find is that women must understand that this is, you know, this is something that's very special that's happening in your body. And your training in the first trimester is going to become less frequent and less intense. And it really mm. is based upon how you feel. And I yeah. find personally feel that one of the reasons that there's mixed information out there in the industry is because there's trainers writing you know what you should and shouldn't do during pregnancy and it's based on the experience that they've had of training women now an yeah. example would be you know they may have only have trained women who have had very little morning sickness they have had no so they've had no nausea they've they've had no problems at all in which case they might be a little bit more aggressive in their first trimester phase of training whereas you might mm. have another trainer who has only seen women who are pot potentially slightly overweight have had a, you know a harder first trimester or they might have only seen women who have had horrendous morning sickness and therefore they're very conservative with their training methods yeah. so yeah. it's really important to know that you actually have to do only what you feel that you are capable of and don't put the pressure yeah. on yourself to continue yeah. to push in the gym. Mm. Yeah, you have to individualise it. Um, you know, everyone's pregnancy is going to be totally different um, and you have to yeah, just base it on person to person, basically. And I think as well, I mean, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but even if you have somebody, and I'll speak for one of my friends who's on the call at the moment, she's, she was very, very fit before, very fit, very healthy, yeah. and she's had mm. the most horrendous debilitating morning sickness. Um, and, yeah. and, you know, and it's been a real life change for her. Um, and mm. I think, you know, potentially being quite difficult to actually mentally cope with the fact that when you yeah training really hard to then being forced to stop because of yeah. morning sickness um I think mentally that can be quite challenging it is I think there's a lot that's been written about the, the sort of the psychological uh, component of you know p people who suffer with nausea and vomiting and women can get really depressed because they can go from being very active to being quite inactive mm -hmm. um because of their symptoms but I think it's important for women you know to not beat themselves up about it if they can't train, um, particularly in that first trimester. The most important thing is that you know you keep yourself well hydrated, you do what you feel that you can do, even if that's just going for a walk for you know 20 minutes or so. Um, and that often I find for women suffering with hyperemesis that just eating little and often uh, is helpful. And also um, eating quite bland foods, um, you know, just things like toast, a um, bit of soup, that sort of thing. Avoiding spicy meals. Ginger can be quite good as well uh, in, in your tea. Um, those sort of things, you know, are helpful in your first trimester. I'll, I'll speak from my mother's experience here. My mum had terrible morning sickness with me, apparently, and Farley's rusks were her go-to food. So uh, yeah. <laughs> And, you know, I think that, you know, this is where we have to take a step out of 
the obsession in the fitness industry for eating obsessively healthy foods. Now, um, unless yeah. you're gluten intolerant, then all right, exceptions made there. But let's be honest here: if you've got terrible morning sickness and the only thing that you can eat is bread and is bread and uh, and butter and some very plain foods, don't be mm. about not having your you know your your egg in the morning for breakfast. So this is yeah. This is where it gets absolutely ridiculous, you know, and the guilt that's mm. associated with not being able to have your eggs or your steak for breakfast in the morning and you can only eat toast. Well, that's totally fine. It's a very special time in your life and you still have to. Yeah. Yeah. You have to be sensible about it. Yeah, absolutely. So what happens then in the second trimester? What, what changes happen in the body and what happens with your hormones? So the second trimester, like I say, your your blood volume increases by up to sort of 40 percent. And that's because your blood flow is going to be needed to, uh, to, for the placenta and for the baby to grow. Because you've got that increase in uh, blood volume, your vascular resistance falls a bit to help pump the blood around the body. So actually you can get a little bit of a drop in your blood pressure. This is where women can be a lot more prone to sort of fainting, um, this is when varicose veins start to, can sometimes start to appear, things like that. So again, if you're in the gym, um, you've got to keep yourself safe. You are more prone to getting dehydrated and fainting, so you've got to keep drinking water. And from about 20 weeks, it's where you start to, you really sort of can't lie flat. And that's because of the compression of the vena cava, which is a major blood vessel that pumps blood around your body. So from about 20 weeks, you want to avoid doing um, exercise with you lying flat. So it might be that, you know, you start to, if you're you know, still doing a bit of weight training, that you're doing it on more of an incline, basically. So those are the sort of things happening in the second trimester. So just just looking at something like that, um, one of the you know we can we can talk about this later, but one of the things we can talk about is pelvic stability. Um, mm. and one of the exercises I guess that's advocated for pelvic stability um, is glute bridges. Now that yeah. in the traditional sense is lying on your back and your hips raised. Now mm. I I have trained some women past twenty weeks doing glute bridges. Mm. But, but I only do it under my, my guidance and my management. And this is another reason why I haven't brought out any training programs for pregnancy because I think that it is very much done on an individualized basis. And yeah. one thing that you can do is, you know, you can do hip thrusts instead. So it's basically like a glute bridge with your back on a bench. Mm -hmm. Um. But even then, like, it's really important for women to realize it's basically the time spent there. So, you know, if you're only yeah. doing 10 reps, well, then that's fine. And you stand up and you kind of move around and let the blood come back. Yeah. Um, you know, you're not going to be, you know, lying there doing 50 to 100 reps of something and really sort of shutting off the blood flow. Yeah. Yeah. And I think this is why it's so important to have been exercising before you were pregnant you, what you mustn't do is start an intense, intense training regime once you get pregnant. Um, it's really important that you, you know, you've been doing things beforehand so that then when you continue exercising through your pregnancy, you know what's right for you, the right techniques. Um, if you haven't done that much exercise before you got pregnant, it's fine to start exercising, but you really should do it with some guidance in the gym with a trainer, you know, like Rachel, who can take you through things and make sure that you don't injure yourself. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, you can still lift some, certainly some fairly decent weights in your upper body um, yeah. during your, your second and your third trimester. And just like, like, yeah. like I said, you know, everything should be more, more on an incline. Um, yeah. I, I do stop my girls pressing above their heads um, yeah. at about about 20 to 24 weeks. And the mm. reason that I do that because as, as soon as you press above your head or any time you're doing, for example, a back squat, you have what's called a, a bilateral oblique brace. So with your obliques and your abs, they basically um, they come together. So you're essentially – um making less space in the abdomen so you, as a when you're breathing you're you're basically creating tension around your core which is awesome if you're lifting heavy weights but when you have a little baby growing inside of you that's not the optimal thing to do and yeah. i think you know 
you know, Becky and I talked about this yesterday. We mm. have to think here, like, what is the purpose? And this is what it comes down to. What is the purpose of exercise during pregnancy? And it sure is yeah. fat loss, unless you know. I mean, we can come on to, um, you know, pregnancy and obesity afterwards, but mm. it sure as hell isn't fat loss and it sure as hell isn't yeah. muscle hypertrophy. It's about health. Yeah. And yeah, making you- and yeah, health and keeping yourself happy while you're pregnant. And Absolutely. women who exercise and keep themselves have healthier, happier pregnancies. Absolutely, and I, and I again, like I really want to reiterate that that point is that you know you have to really ask yourself what is the purpose of your training, and it should be mm. that you can be strong for your for birth, and you know you're basically a happy, healthy pregnancy, and you know happy, healthy people yeah. generally tend to like exercise. Yeah, um, I think what's difficult for so many women is that there's such conflicting sort of advice out there as to you know what they should be doing and how they should be doing it and even when I looked at the literature you know there is no um, sort of set um, guidelines for women who exercise in pregnancy what I tend to advise people is that if you imagine you've got all this extra blood flow in your body because it needs to go to the placenta obviously when you're exercising some of that blood flow will be diverted away from the placenta to those exercising muscles. Now that's not going to cause a problem for the baby, but what I tend to say is that if you are exercising, you probably don't want to go much more than sort of uh, sort of 70 above 70% of your maximum effort. And that way you know there's plenty of blood flow going to, to baby and that you can carry on exercising, you know, and, and getting, um, you know, uh, doing what you normally do and getting results from it. Does that make sense, right? Yeah, it, absolutely. Um, look, one of the things that, um, one of the questions actually the girls asked was, um, you know, what, what would be the, um, this is a question um, from Ria. I may as well just read this out now because it kind of applies here. Um, mm. I've been reading up and trying to understand the positioning of the pelvis during exercise when pregnant. The information out there doesn't really translate well into what exercises aid good pelvic position. And any mm -hmm. would be great and um some guidance on maximum heart rate i think the midwives are a bit over cautious about this my peaks at about 150 to 160 beats per minute depending on which mm -hmm. body part um and yeah just not getting too breathless so i guess there's two yeah. questions in there um if yeah. you want to answer the heart rate one first and then i can talk about um yeah. pelvic stability again you know there is no there is no absolute rule as to what your maximum heart rate should be and for every person it will completely differ depending on your level of fitness you know lots of papers will state that you know you shouldn't aim for your heart rate to go above about 160 and I think that's fairly sensible what you, again and this goes back to why you should be exercising before you're pregnant um, if you are somebody who has really not exercised before you were pregnant and then suddenly you are in, in doing intense exercise where you're shooting up your heart rate that that's not good um, like I say you want to be doing about 70% of your sort of maximum effort and I'd, I'd say 160 as a guideline but everyone will be slightly different you have to do what you're comfortable with um, but yeah, what 160 is what a lot of the papers will say uh, as a maximum. Right? Yeah, I generally tend to stick to 160 based on based on current research. But again, if mm -hmm. I've got somebody who's very very fit and they happen to go yeah. over a little bit, well, yeah. you know, and if they're feeling good, the studies show that even if your heart rate goes above that, there has never been any. Um, uh, evidence that that causes long-term problems for the baby awesome I, I think that's what we, we're all hoping for you know and, and wanting is a healthy a healthy baby yeah absolutely that's that is the ultimate goal <laughs> absolutely so uh, you know just to answer the second part of that question where she's asking about mm -hmm. uh, the positioning of the pelvis um yeah you know, let's talk about the third trimester and obviously when you're full term and you have a lot of instability, um, what yeah. happens there? And then I guess we can talk about pelvic position during exercise. Yeah. So basically, as you go into the um, you know third trimester, the uterus is getting uh, much bigger. 
your breasts are getting bigger as well. And there's a higher level of the hormone called relaxin. Uh, relaxin is needed to um, sort of soften uh, the joints around the pelvis, the symphysis pubis and the sacroiliac joints to allow the, obviously the baby is getting bigger and for the baby to drop more into your pelvis and to prepare you for labour. Now because of that relaxin hormone, the joints around the pelvis get weaker and it predisposes women who are pregnant to getting a lot of uh, lower back pain or synthesis pubis dysfunction. Um, and you see, as your, your abdomen, you become more pregnant, you see an increase in the lumbar lordosis. Um, so it's really important in, um, throughout your pregnancy and afterwards that you're doing exercises that improve your core stability, basically. Um, and work those um, sort of those deep muscles of the abdominal wall, like the transversus. Um, you might want to talk about a bit more about um, certain exercises that are good to do. Yeah. So I, I mean, again, it's 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 personal. It's down to down to each one. But like, let's let's go from the global exercises and the ones that are safe to do when you're full term pre full term pregnancy. And this is how I would train my girls. Um, personally, I don't back squat my girls um, mm -hmm. when they fall pregnant. And that's just a yeah. general rule that I have. Um, yes, we sometimes do goblet squats. We'll do sumo squats and sumo deadlifts with kettlebells. Anything really yeah. – uh, and sumo deadlifts are – and sumo, particularly with a kettlebell, are excellent in pregnancy because it basically it, – it, increases force closure and, and form closure in the hips and the sacred iliac joint so mm. what that means is that the femur is pushing up into the pelvis and it's actually closing off the sacrum mm. rather than when we yeah. squat. when we come into a deep squat you can actually have separation um between um between uh, in the sacred iliac joint so we want to basically keep those joints as together as we possibly can so I, I'm a, a big fan of um, a bo you know box squatting. So they're certainly not um, bum to floor. So ass to grass squatting. I, yeah. I, I don't do that with my pregnant ladies. Some people do, mm -hmm. and that's fine. That's based, you know, if you're an experienced trainer and you feel that that's appropriate for your client, that's fine. Personally, I have a blank blanket rule. I don't do it. Um, yeah. Other things I do. Um, I really like step ups. Um, so. Yeah forward step ups and then when somebody becomes very heavily pregnant I take them more into a side step up to accommodate for a, a big time uh, yeah I do a lot of um I do a, a lot of rowing so a lot of back exercises um yeah. and you know a lot of single arm work so single arm rows um you know yeah. if I'm going to do a lat pull down I, t I tend to favor a single arm lat pull down um mm -hmm. Because, you know, obviously when you're pulling from above your head, usually you have to use, again, you have to use your core with that bilateral brace. Wow. Um, and we want to try and avoid that, but we still want to engage the core. So I do a lot of single arm work. And essentially, yeah. my pregnant ladies almost train like bodybuilders because they're, particularly with their upper body, because you can do as many reps as you like with bicep curls and mm -hmm. tricep extensions and lateral raises and single arm yeah. and presses. And I think the thing is to get creative and mm. it only doesn't have to be boring, um, but it needs to be sensible. And when we're talking about pelvic position uh, during pregnancy, you know, some some women are able to do lunges right into their, you know, the third trimester if they're already mm. very strong. Whereas yes. if some women are slightly weaker and don't have the, the hip stability, um, yeah. then obviously no um lunges and yeah. are not an appropriate exercise to do mm. Um, mm. yeah you do have to listen to your own body because like we keep saying every pregnancy will be different and so what a, a group of exercises that will work for one woman brilliantly won't work for another woman because of you know the the spd that she's got so again it's you know about um you know talking to you know to to, to Rachel and getting ideas of to, you know what's what's going to work for you and keep you safe in the gym without doing without injuring yourself because the most the time you're most likely to injure yourself is in that third trimester because you know because your weight has shifted it's easy for you to lose balance 
Um, you know, what you don't want to do is, you know, either fall in the gym or, like I say, st you know, strain yourself. Um, before you go into labour, because labour's hard enough without going into it with an injury. Um, I don't have a child yet, but I'm, uh, I have to say I'm not looking forward to labour. I've heard some horror stories. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, just on the, um, on the, the note of um, symptoms of puberty disorder, Katie has said, um, I've been, um, I have um, pelvic pain and mm -hmm. I have the start of SPD and I was wanting to know the best exercises to help and the ones to completely avoid so I guess what yeah. is, I mean ones that I would completely avoid with um uh SPD would be anything where your your legs are wide uh sorry wide apart yeah wide or single leg step or anything where your legs are very um uh an example would be I certainly wouldn't be squatting um yeah I would be doing a lot of glute bridging yeah, doing a lot of like, um, like hamstrings. Could you do sort of side planks and things like that? I think uh, can be absolutely, quite... like side yeah. planks, like side clams. You know, it, it's the very much yeah. the, the type of stuff as well that I would give to somebody with um, diastasis recti. So you know, things like yeah. um, you know, child's pose, side clams, hip thrusts. Um, yeah. You can do basic squats, but that you know sumo squats, anything that doesn't hurt you, basically. Yes. Everything must be done very slowly with time and attention rather than weight. Now, yeah, when I talk about time and attention, we'll use the squat as an example. So, um, a lot of women, um, and I see this as well in pregnancy, they'll do twenty reps of something and say, "Oh, that's too light. Um, I'll add more load." Well. Yeah. 20 reps can be light if you're you know if you're using body weight and you're going up down up down up down so it's one second down one second up one second down one second up it becomes a lot harder if you yeah. slow down the exercise and you come down for four seconds you pause for a second yeah. at the bottom you really engage your glutes and then you raise for four seconds yeah so yeah and I, and I you know to, just talking about the weight you know side of things you know I, as a gynecologist as well, I do see people 30 years down the line after they've had their children with things like, you know, prolapse and incontinence and things like that. And I think particularly as, you know, you go into your third trimester and the pregnancy is getting heavier, you shouldn't be aiming to lift, you know, the heaviest weights that you can do because that's really not going to help your pelvic floor in the long run. You know, certainly do weights. But like you say, you know, do them a bit lighter, but do them as, as a slower rep, basically. It's not about, you know, doing the heaviest weights that you can do because, I say, your, your pelvic floor may not thank you for it in the long run. And this is the one thing that really concerns me. You know, we see, like, CrossFit, obviously, is, is really popular mm -hmm. nowadays. And we yeah. see really strong girls in CrossFit, and they're, they're heavily pregnant, you know, well into their third trimester, about to give birth. Yeah squatting yeah. still like 50 to 60 kilos now yeah. where they that might be a light weight for them but as, yeah. as a like being medically trained and understanding what actually happens mm. in the body I would be really concerned as, as to mm. internal damage that could potentially be done even if it's not yeah. now if they had another child and another one and in the future the internal yeah. damage that is done yeah yeah it's like I say you may not have any problems with doing it now, but 10, 20, 30 years from now, when you're struggling with stress incontinence or you've got prolapse, you know, it's not a nice thing to go through. And I do think that that's, you know, that doing heavy weights at that stage in your pregnancy, I personally don't think is a good thing. And, and, and this is coming from somebody who is a former athlete. You've lifted heavy weights. We train together, so I'm. Yeah. Um, yeah. And this is this is coming from somebody and myself included. And granted, I have not had a child and I've not been pregnant, but I can tell you now when I do, I will be more erring on the side of caution than pushing myself in the yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's you know sensible. Yeah, I I I, th I mean I, that's the I guess the general message that we want to get across here. Mm. Um, uh, what about food? So let's talk about food yeah. during pregnancy. Okay. You know, so I think the thing, uh, so what I say to people always is, sadly, you are not eating for two. 
<laughs> lots of people suddenly think they get pregnant and you can go crazy. Actually, you know, in the first and second trimester, you only need an extra 150 calories a day uh, for a healthy pregnancy and, and 300 calories in the third trimester. So it's not a lot. <laughs> so you can't suddenly start, uh, you know, binging and thinking that the, the baby will uh, take up everything that you're eating. Um, obviously, there's certain foods that you need to avoid when you're pregnant. Uh, the main ones I talk about, I uh, would say, are soft cheeses, things like um, brie, camembert, the blue cheeses. The main reason is, is there's a lot of extra moisture in the, those cheeses, so you get um, increased bacteria. And the, the main thing we worry about is a condition called Listeria. It's very rare. Um, but if you were unfortunate enough to get it, there is an increased risk of uh, miscarriage and stillbirth uh, with it. So that's why I would say to avoid soft cheeses. And that's the same with pate as well. There's a risk of listeria with that. Um, then things like undercooked meats. Again, it's rare, but we worry about something called toxoplasmosis, which is a parasite that can live uh, in uh, meats that are not cooked properly. Um, and again, if you were unlucky enough to have toxoplasmosis, there's a risk of miscarriage, stillbirth, and some congenital abnormalities that can affect the baby. Uh, so those are the main ones that I took to say. Things like undercooked uh, eggs will give you salmonella, food poisoning. Um, uh, so just to make sure that you've cooked your eggs properly. Cured meats as well, there's a risk of toxoplasmosis. Um, in terms of um, shellfish, you just make, have to, again, have to make sure that it's cooked properly um, so that uh, you don't get food poisoning. Sushi is fine as long as it's been frozen first. Um, so you might need to check uh, wherever you're buying it that it ha is, uh, has been frozen first. And in terms of, you, you shouldn't eat things like um, shark and marlin, and you shouldn't have more than, say, two tuna steaks in a week because they're higher levels of mercury, uh, which isn't good for the baby. Um, and then just in terms of caffeine, just while I think about it, as I've got a cup of tea in front of me, the guideline is for about 200 milligrams of caffeine a day. Um, the reason we limit caffeine is that it can cause your baby to be uh, growth restricted at a smaller in weight. So I think one cup of coffee is about 100 milligrams. So two cups of coffee is, you know, fine. Um, or if you're going to have some dark chocolate, you know, that will constitute some of your caffeine, you know, with your coffee. Um, yeah, I can't think of anything else off the top of my head. And just and, and uh, again, like just eating like a healthy nourishing diet and this should be yeah. well before you fall pregnant you know you should you should yeah. just get to the stage where you fall pregnant and think well shit now I have to do something about it and I guess like now is a good time to talk about obesity in pregnancy so I mean what are yeah. the I mean first of all what do you term as obese and what are the risks yeah. of pregnancy and how do you manage um mm. a, a pre a, an obese pregnant mum? yeah it's 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 something that is becoming increasingly prevalent um, and it is a real problem for us as obstetricians. We say that anyone with a BMI above 30 uh, is at increased risk of having problems uh, in their pregnancy and in their delivery. So anyone with a BMI above 30 will have a, a consultant uh, review during their pregnancy. It's re they tend so it's really important that not only do they take a higher amount of uh, folic acid, they also need vitamin D as well because uh, uh, women overweight tend to be uh, deficient in vitamin D. So that's we give them uh, those uh, vitamins to take. They're much more likely to develop things like gestational diabetes uh, and preeclampsia. Uh, we also have to uh, scan them more regularly because obviously, you know, women who are overweight in pregnancy, it's difficult to measure how well the baby is growing because it's just more difficult to palpate women's abdomens so they have more scans. Um, 
Then in terms of uh, delivery, they're more likely to go post dates, they're more likely to end up being induced, and you're more likely to end up with an emerge either an instrumental delivery, and if you have an instrumental delivery, they're more likely to get things called third degree tears, which are you know worse tears to have um, delivery, and they're more likely to end up with an emergency cesarean section. And Obviously, because they are overweight, the operation is technically more difficult, and your recovery afterwards uh, uh, isn't as good. So you tend to be in hospital for longer, and that you have problems with wound healing and an increased risk of infection as well. Um, so it's a huge problem and something that I see every day. Uh, as part of my work, and it's it's a it's a real challenge actually. I mean, for you know, overall, you know, the normal sort of weight gain in pregnancy is sort of between sort of 10 and 15 kilograms. For women who are morbidly obese, we actually work with them with a dietitian so that not only do they not put on any weight in pregnancy, they actually lose weight in pregnancy. So we have to give them a very uh, sort of strict diet to try and follow. Um, so yeah, it's 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 a challenge, and and that again, that's why it's just so important to be fit and healthy, you know, before you even embark on pregnancy. Mm. It's a, it's a massive challenge, and I think sometimes we come so far in the fitness industry out of that world, and um, mm. it's a it's a very big problem because. Not only is the, you know, obesity in itself, it's not just a case of eating less and exercising more. There's a lot of psychological um, factors that need to be addressed. There's a lot of metabolic yeah. factors that need to be addressed. There's so many hormonal changes that happen in the body when somebody's obese. So, you know, it, it's not simply a case of, well, eat less, exercise more. And if it was that easy, then everybody would be yeah. doing it. Um, yeah. It, you know, you need, yeah. you know, like social, like psychosocial support, like, it's it's a big big problem but ultimately it still comes down to not taking responsibility for oneself yeah yeah you know ultimately there's always something you can do i know not everyone is going to be able to get to a gym or you know that's but as i say to a lot of you know the women particularly when they've developed diabetes you know and they've got kids you know don't don't drive just walk, you know, just a 20 minute walk to the school and back, you know, after you've had your breakfast or at the end of the day, that will help tremendously with your blood sugars. You know, if you can just do those little things that will help. Um, it's not, you know, always about, you know, you know, joining a gym and things like that. It's what you can maybe do at home as well. A hundred percent. And it's the small things. And even in the fitness industry, you know, where we are completely the other way, where we obviously do encourage people to go to the gym and those who are yeah. enough to have time and the, you know, the finances to be able to go to a gym. But there is also so much more that you can do. And I think, you know, just speaking about women in general, one of the reasons that they fail um, on a plan is because they set too high expectations of themselves and then they don't actually yeah they can do it so they mm. say, well diet starts on monday i'm going to go to the gym five times this week well you know it's <laughs> tuesday now why don't you start just having something better for lunch and go yeah. in the afternoon like start somewhere and you can all you're right mm. you can always do something yeah yeah no definitely um ladies if you've got any questions just um pop them in the box there um i don't have any other questions um from my end um, mm -hmm. I think I've been. Should we talk about postnatal stuff? Yes, let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. So no one, no one. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So what? Okay, so had your baby. Um, let's talk about how many weeks you should be um, resting for. You know what? You know if you have a natural yeah. birth, and um, what happens if you have a cesarean section? How many weeks off should you have, and when should you get back? Yeah. yeah. So. Um, if you've had a normal delivery um, and you know no complications, what I say is that if you're feeling good and you want to start doing a little bit of you know sort of gentle exercise in those sort of first few weeks, then you know you know go for some you know nice long walks with the baby and the pram. If you want to do a little bit of swimming, um, you know all those things are you know fine in the first few weeks. But without a doubt, you, you <laughs> particularly when it's your first baby. 
it is such a roller coaster and you can be so tired um, you know you might be trying to you know learn how to breastfeed or even if you're bottle feeding you know you're up during the night so it's it's such an overwhelming experience those first weeks so what I say to people is if you don't want to do anything in those sort of first six to eight weeks then honestly don't but you know sometimes it's nice just to go out get some fresh air and do some sort of brisk walking and long walks I usually say if you want to then start you know getting back into your um, sort of pre-pregnancy sort of a training regime then have your six week check first um, get checked out by the GP and if they're happy then you can really you know start to go back and um, and exercise more intensely if you have had a cesarean section then you know the recovery is longer you know with my son I had an emergency cesarean section in the end um, typically as a doctor that's what tends to happen um, but in all honesty, it was it was at least five months before I felt that I could go back to a gym and train properly. There is no way that I would have been ready at six weeks to get back in the gym and you know lift some weights and things because I simply did not feel well enough. Mm -hmm. So in those first few months, all I did was I just enjoyed my son. I went you know went for some you know long walks a couple of times a day. I was breastfeeding as well so actually the weight kind of fell off to be honest you know and as long as you eat sensibly as well um, then you know you're not going to have a problem losing the weight afterwards. Second time round I now have a seven week old daughter I had an elective cesarean section this time round and my recovery has been a hundred percent better um, you know, even after the second, you know, after the first week, I wasn't taking any painkillers. After the second week, I was picking up my son, putting him to bed, and he's probably 12, 13 kilos or something there. Um, so, so I'm seven weeks down the line. Yeah, I feel like I could go back to the gym now. Uh, I, I feel ready to start training properly. But, you know, you have to listen to your own body and you know some women who've had normal deliveries still you know it will take them three months or so before they you know feel even remotely ready to go back into gym you know like we keep saying it's about listening to your own body and doing what's you know what what's right for you basically but that's certainly my experience anyway well I can't speak from experience <laughs> but I can speak from uh... From training ladies and I think the most important thing to to realize is that when you have a cesarean section it is it's a major operation right yeah it's a, exactly it's a big op even if you have a natural and a you know a natural birth and it's no complications it's a big deal like there's a lot of trauma that happens to your body and yeah. you have to understand sometimes that even if you feel good on the outside there's this can sometimes be a lot of internal healing that needs yeah so I always yeah. have six week guidelines. So six weeks is a general standard rule um, uh, for natural, and I usually use anywhere between. If somebody has been very fit and healthy um, before and very strong, and they've been, it's been an elective um, cesarean, or if it's been a very straightforward cesarean, then I may mm -hmm. potentially bring them back at ten weeks. But it's most yeah. likely to be twelve weeks before any yeah. with you know full doctor's clearance as well. So again, I. Yeah. On the side of caution there yeah yeah no it's important because as what you know when you have a cesarean you know when we do the operation you know we go through the skin we go through the fat layer and then we we sort of we, we don't cut through the rectus muscle but we separate them to allow us to then um, get to the to the uterus so you know you're going to have some diastasis of the rectile muscle after you've had a cesarean as well you're going to have it after you've had a, a natural delivery as well but you need to let you know the layers sort of come back together um, as well before you you, know, you really start training because you know what happens is if you start you know over training too soon before those muscle layers have you know come back together then you know you can actually end up you know, creating bulges in your abdomen um, that will never go, basically, because you haven't allowed the, the reptile muscle to come back properly. Mm. I think that's an important point to make. So, uh, like, b baby steps, literally, like, small steps. Yeah. And, like, you know, just 1% every day, like, small things. Yeah. 
Um, just a question here. Um, if you're breastfeeding, should you take on extra calories? Um, so you do burn extra calories when you're breastfeeding. Again, you know, it, it's in the region of a couple of hundred extra calories per day. Um, it's really important to keep really well hydrated when you're breastfeeding. So every time that you feed, you know, you, you've got to have a bottle of water with you uh, so that you're um, keeping yourself hydrated. You don't need a lot of extra calories, but certainly, you know, um, you, you without doubt you will lose weight quite quickly when you are breastfeeding as well. Um, but I, I, I like to have, you know, a really occasional chocolate or so, you know, when I'm bre well, breastfeeding, make the milk a bit more, a bit sweeter. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we are women, you know, we like cake and chocolate now and again. And <laughs> yeah, you've got to be realistic. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I've got another question here. So, um, uh, so I have, um, I have potential. Um, I have two. I will have two children under two. Um, yeah. Newly pregnant now. Yeah. yeah. Good luck. Yeah. Actually, it's really not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what can I do now that will specifically help me with post-pregnancy, particularly juggling a heavier baby who wants to be picked up and held yeah. and the newborn? My first labor yeah. was normal, um, was yeah. sorry, was natural, long but natural, with no real complications. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I say Morgan, uh, my son, he's now 23 months and, you know, he's a strong boy. I have to say I was worried about how I was going to be able to you know pick him up and things like that when you know I just had a newborn baby I think towards the end of my pregnancy I did try as much as I could to to, to well to not pick him up quite as much so I was encouraging him to go sort of up and down the stairs himself um, you know just little things that I thought might help me um, once I'd had my daughter um, you know, you need extra support in those first couple of weeks so that you're not having to do the heavy lifting. Um, so, you know, trying to get your husband to obviously take time off after the baby's been born or your partner, you know, getting mum, dad around. Um, in actual fact, though, like I said, you know, I, I had a, um, I mean, hopefully, um, you know, you'll have a nice normal delivery um, so that your your recovery is even quicker. For me, even you know, second time around having a cesarean, I was lucky. My recovery's been good, and by the end of the second week, it really wasn't a problem picking my son up. Um, and I say he's he's pretty heavy. Um, so hopefully, you know, you you would be the same as well. And it, like I say, it's just about having extra support as well, and maybe tra training them a little bit to to do a bit more themselves, and and to not always expect to be picked up. Yeah. And what about older pregnancies? So, you know, we do we do see it now, and I certainly see it, um, uh, particularly women over the age of 38, you know, coming into their 40s, mm -hmm. who are very, very fit, and they look yeah. fantastic yeah. Um, yeah. having babies into their 40s. What are the potential yeah. risks and complications and, and, you know? Yeah. I mean, for, again, you know, there is, I've seen some women in their, you know, 40s, have a absolutely uh, normal pregnancy and delivery um, without, you know, say not have any problems. But as you get older, you are more likely to develop, to develop high blood pressure, preeclampsia, and diabetes in pregnancy. Um, and sometimes your the, your labour isn't as good. You have a you know slightly higher risk of having a cesarean. Some just because the uterus, for some reason, and we don't really know why, isn't um, as good at um, contracting um, and then afterwards you I mean, many women will absolutely bounce back without a problem but occasionally for the older women particularly and you know and I've seen women in their mid to late 40s having children uh, and I've actually looked after a couple of women in their 50s as well they find the postnatal period very difficult um, the tiredness, I think, seems to affect them more. They tend to spend a bit longer in hospital after they've um, delivered. And, they, yeah, they can just be a little bit slower to recover, basically. Um, but, uh, you know, every woman will, will, be, will be different. But, unfortunately, 
age does get to some of it. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Um, ladies on the call, do you have any more questions before we start to wrap this up? If you do, please pop them in the box. Don't be shy. Ask any questions. Um, yeah, pregnancy. Ask anything you like. Anything, anything you like, go ahead. Um, uh, I'm amazed that Lila has slept all the way through this. <laughs> I know, I know. I was, I was going to preempt the call and say, well, Beck does have a, a, a newborn at home, so but she slept. She's a great baby. Great yeah, to well from a young age. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> um, one of my girls says an amazing name for a baby, Lila. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, God, it's so, so difficult trying to pick names. Oh, God, I went round in circles, but yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, if there's no other questions, it doesn't look like there's any from here. Um, but thank you so much. Like, it's been so lovely to reconnect with you after so many years. And, you know, we yeah, talked on Facebook and everything. But, um, you know, we're both both Cardiff girls. We went to the same school. And it's kind of nice that we've sort of, you know, stayed in touch. And um, it's yeah, really lovely to do some work with you as well. And thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. No problem. Anytime. Fabulous. Well, um, uh, one of my girls says, yes, you're, you're two posh Cardiff girls. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't seen a that. few glasses of wine. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, ladies, thank you so much for being on the call. Um, I'm going to end this one um, right now. So thank you. Thank and you. Thank you. And we'll chat to you soon.